Okay. Like the background. I made it myself. <laughs> oh, very good. Okay. It should be set up now. How are things at CMSA? Is everything in person? Not, not a seminar yet, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, we, we are allowed to go to offices right now. So people are in the offices, but no seminars? A seminar is mostly online. I see. People, people go to office. But... Pardon me? People, people go to office. How about, how about you? Um, how about you? Well, I think it's a, it's a mix here, yeah. 
Thank you, people. We'll go to the Zoom. So I'll get started. That's a good thing. Welcome, everyone, to Quantum Matter in Math and Physics Seminar Series at Harvard CMSA. It's our great honor to invite Professor Daniel Stewart Free from Texas. He will be speaking about the long anticipating topics on symmetry types in quantum field theory and the charge refraction universal CRT theory. Uh, I'd like to remind the audience, please feel free to uh, interact. Feel free to interact or ask questions during the talk. You may raise your hand first. So let's just directly welcome uh, Professor Dan. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Juven. Thank you for the invitation. So, um, so this lecture is actually a request from Juven to talk about uh, some aspects having to do with symmetry, and in particular, the what's usually known as the CPT theorem uh, in quantum field theory. And this discussion appears in this paper with Mike Hopkins. So this is joint work with Mike Hopkins. It was part of work about um, classifying invertible field theories and so on. And this is some background that strictly speaking, we didn't need for the proofs and so on, but really sets it in the right place and gave us an opportunity to engage with this uh, kind of standard material. So really there's very little new here. I think the discussion of symmetry types is, um, you know, synthesizes various things and we will encounter in our discussion some standard theorem statements in quantum field theory, uh, some version twisting of the uh, coleman mandula theorem, spin statistics, and then the main thing, the, the CPT theorem. Um, but the CPT theorem was proved by Yost long ago. I think it was Yost, I hope. And um, some particular points about symmetry were identified at least in a special case in a paper of um, Greaves and Thomas, who also proved the CPT theorem in a different framework. So again, this is mostly a kind of expository pedagogical um, talk. So let me begin by just placing our discussion in a more general context of uh, just really differential geometry. So let me talk briefly about symmetry types in uh, affine geometry. But it's really in differential geometry. And again, um, as Juven says, please do interrupt and ask questions. Um, Okay, so let's let A n be the standard affine n-dimensional space. So this is a real n-dimensional space. It's the affine space looks something like this, consisting of points. A point here is an ordered n-tuple of real numbers. And the vector space, which is the group R n, acts on it simply transitively. And that encodes the global parallelism of affine geometry. Given any two points, there's a unique displacement, which is a vector in Rn that takes us from one point to the other. And the symmetry group here is the affine group. It has a normal subgroup consisting of translations. So these are the translations. And the quotient by that normal subgroup acts on the displacements. If you like, it's the differential of an affine transformation, an invertible map from a n to a n, characterized by the differential being constant. That's what an affine transformation is. And so that's an invertible n by n matrix. Those matrices form a group, the general linear group. And um, so that's just basic affine geometry. And we carry that over to smooth manifolds which we won't use in this talk, where the parallelism doesn't exist on a smooth manifold, but we have a substitute, a, a connection, usually torsion-free connection in linear geometry, linear connection. And then this is the infinitesimal symmetries or structural symmetries of the tangent spaces. Now, when we do geometry, we want to not do all affine transformation, but specify some kind of symmetry type. So an n-dimensional 
symmetry type is a pair, is a Lie group, Gn, and a homomorphism, rho n from Gn to Gln. Okay. And we usually think of this, well, let's just immediately give some examples. So one example is to take the orthogonal group, which in this case is a subgroup of GLNR. That's the symmetry type that is for Euclidean geometry in flat space and Riemannian geometry in curved space. A variation would be to have the spin group say, that's no longer, that map now rho n is no longer injective nor surjective. And um, that's, of course, the symmetry type of spin geometry. And there are many others. We could have complex geometry, symplectic geometry, the symplectic group. We could have um, the geometry of having a subspace, so distribution, foliation, and so on and so forth. So there are many, many symmetry types. And this is really uh, kind of the philosophy, the Erlangen program of Felix Klein, that says that geometry is determined by a symmetry group and you study invariance under the symmetry group. So in fact, in this case, we could say that the orthogonal group is the group that preserves an inner product on Rn, the dot product. It's a little bit harder to say what the spin group is in those terms. So once we have that group, then the symmetry group in our flat space, we want to include translations. And so I'll just write, so we get used to this kind of diagram that, um, yeah, so we take the sequence, which is a group extension that we have above. And now we have this homomorphism from some other group GN and we make what's called the pullback. So we make a group say GN that sits in here. And we make this a pullback. Pullback means that this group is a subgroup of the product of these two groups, the direct product, it's the subgroup of pairs of elements that map to the same element here. And so these are then the affine symmetries. It includes the um, translation symmetries. These are the affine symmetries that act on our flat geometry, but now act um, preserving whatever structure we have. So for example, in the case of the orthogonal group, these are the Euclidean transformations, the rotations, reflections, translations, and so on. The Galilean geometry is another one. And what we're going to do is, um, is of course relativistic geometry. So let's turn to that. So in relativistic QFT. So the model space here is Minkowski space time. So this is Minkowski space time. And I'll just call it M. And again, we have, so that's just the standard affine space and we have the standard vector space acting on it. I'll call that V. But now this vector space V is equipped with a uh, Lorentz metric just the standard Lorentz metric. And it's also equipped with a time orientation. So remember that the standard Lorentz metric, if this is V, then in the standard Lorentz metric, we have um, the null vectors. And so the vectors with positive uh, norm square in my convention um, are the time-like vectors. And those come in two components and we choose one component of those time-like vectors to be positively oriented. Okay. So the symmetry group that preserves that is, well, it's the orthogonal group O1 um, N minus one. That's the group of transformations that preserves the Lorentz metric. But if we also wanna preserve time orientation, then we get a subgroup of index two. So recall that as long as n is at least two, which I'm going to assume, in fact, I will mostly assume n is at least three, 
if n is at least two, then um, right, this is sitting in O n O one n minus one. This Lie group has four components, and this Lie group has two components. Okay. And um, well, there's the affine version, which is um, the isometries then of this Lorentz metric acting on Minkowski space time. And we have the ones that preserve the time orientation sitting again as a subgroup. And then inside here are the translations like that. So the symmetry group that we start with is here. It's this group. That's the symmetry group that preserves both the metric, the Lorentz metric, and the time orientation. You need a time orientation, for example, dually, that gives an orientation of the dual variable, which is energy. And we need to know what positive energy is in a um, quantum field theory. Okay. So then the definition, as on the left, is that a relativistic symmetry type. G one n minus one rho n is again is a Lie group G one n minus one and a homomorphism from this group now to this orthogonal group that preserves the Lorentz group, the subgroup that preserves the time orientation um, such that the image of rho n uh, contains the identity component, which is SO one n minus one. So that's the identity component. Okay. So again, this orthogonal group that preserves the time orientation has two components. The identity component preserves the overall orientation as well as the, the uh, time orientation. And this condition is what's telling us we have relativistic invariance. We don't want to take the symmetry group to be too small, then we won't have relativistic invariance. Okay, so we'll define K to be the kernel of um, rho n. And so these are the internal symmetries. So yeah, I saw a talk yesterday by Robert Dykraff and he used this metaphor where you think of, and you can think of this on the left in general in geometry, that we think of having the space on which we're doing geometry and then we paint, we take and paint some other geometric structure on it. Here, we're going to paint the structure of a relativistic quantum field theory. So if we have symmetries, those symmetries preserve that paint, that extra structure, but they induce a symmetry of the underlying geometry. And that's what this homomorphism rho n here is telling us. It's telling us how a symmetry of the whole system induces a symmetry of the underlying geometry. And so the kernel of rho n, those are the ones, the symmetries that induce the trivial map on the underlying geometry. So they're internal. They're not moving the points of space time, they're internal symmetries. Okay. And again, we can do um, the pullback, which is on the left. And so we can define the affine group of symmetries. Let me just write it. So we have these, um, the isometries, again, of space time that preserve the time orientation. And we've said on the level of the vectors how um, we have a general symmetry which is preserving some extra structure we haven't specified, possibly this internal structure. And now we can put them together to get uh, a group of uh, symmetries that also move the points of um, the points of space time, include the translations. All right. So again, feel free to jump in at any time with questions. So maybe just make sure the notation 
uh, people follow is that the SO upper arrow has one component, uh, one connect piece, and O also going to group. O upper, upper arrow has two components uh, relayed by time reversal that you define, and the O without arrow, that one has four components. That's correct. Yeah. And, and it's similarly for the I, the I sitting there. Uh, That's the correct. Also, also have one, two, or four components. Yeah, this has two components, and this one has four components. Four components. That's correct. So these transformations might reverse um, the orientation of space, but they preserve the orientation of time. Thank you. Good. Yeah, so let me remark that what's usually called the Poincaré group, while well, there are various things you might call the Poincaré group, but what I call the Poincaré group, and I think this is standard, is we take the connected component of this group or of this group, and we take a certain non-trivial double cover. So for example, this group has a unique non-trivial double cover group that's called the spin group. And then we make the affine version of that, that's called the Poincaré group. And notice that in what I'm saying, the Poincaré group is essentially appearing as a quotient. There's a map out from our symmetries to the Poincaré group. I'm not assuming that the Poincaré group sits as a subgroup of symmetries. So in older treatments, the um, Poincaré group is assumed to be a subgroup rather than a quotient. It, it, there's a map in from the Poincaré group rather than a map out to the Poincaré group. But I hope I've convinced you, maybe this analogy with paint, that the natural map is out. If you have some geometric structure and its symmetries, that induces a symmetry on the underlying points. And that's the natural map. Also, I should comment that there are more general possibilities, of course, for this internal group K. I've assumed that the groups are Lie groups, and that's what I'm sticking with in this talk. But we know, for example, we might have um, super Lie groups. We might have super symmetries. That's one possibility. We might have higher symmetries, more homotopical symmetries. That's another possibility. And um, yes, I'm also going to assume, I guess I didn't say that here. Uh, so let's see, I'll just add that here. So assumption is that this group K is a compact Lie group. So the internal symmetries I'm going to assume are compact. And um, of course that's not necessarily true and that's yet another generalization. All right. So here's a um, table of some possible uh, groups, some simple examples. So if we had a theory with no other symmetries, but just with bosons, then the symmetry group would be this connected component and there's no internal symmetries at all. If we allow fermions, then we get the double cover group, which as I said, is the spin group. And then the internal symmetries are mu two, the center of the spin group. Mu two just means plus minus one, the second square roots of unity. And, um, and, and so those plus or minus one, they act trivially, of course, on the points of space time. These are theories without uh, time reversal symmetry. If we have time reversal symmetry, then it comes initially in the symmetry group as saying that we also have symmetry under reflection in space. The time reversal part of it is the content of this CPT or CRT theorem. So when we have that, then we, if we had no other symmetries and just bosons, then we would have this entire group would be our symmetry group. But if we also have fermions, then we need a double cover. And we need a double cover whose identity component is this Lorentz spin group. So we have a two component Lie group. We've said the double cover of the identity component. And then it's a simple theorem from covering space theory that there are two possible uh, double covers of that two component Lie group. So that's a lemma you could prove. And just abstractly, when I have, again, a Lie group with two components, I have a double cover of its identity component. And I wanna know what are the double covers of the whole group that extend that double cover. So that's the situation here where this is the identity component. This is the double cover of the identity component. And this is our two component Lie group. 
And those two possibilities are in fact the two pin groups. And they sit inside Clifford algebras, which have different signatures. So the first number tells how many generators squared a plus one. The second one tells how many generators squared a minus one. And inside that group, the pin group again would have four components double covering this orthogonal group. We take two of the components. And those are the two possible double covers. So those are different possible uh, symmetry types in a relativistic field theory. They correspond to theories with fermions and time reversal, and eventually the time reversal uh, distinguished by that. But we only know that time reversal after the CPT theorem. Okay. So let me then state this theorem. Um, And again, I'm calling it after Witten the CRT theorem because I think the P for parity, I think parity is taken to be the, the kind of the transformation that's minus one on all coordinates. And that depending on the dimension either reverses or the parity of the dimension, it's, it's not quite what you want. So you wanna have the one that reflects in space, just reverses one sign. And so uh, it's the following, so let, uh, Q be a relativistic quantum field theory with symmetry type G1 n minus one rho n. So I'll say as the lecture uh, evolves what I mean by relativistic quantum field theory, but I'll be working in the Whiteman framework. Then uh, there exists a coextension. Well, it's really an extension, if you like. Um, so we have our group G. Oh, sorry. And now we're going to have it sitting inside a bigger group. I'll call G1 n minus 1 beta. And um, it sits there with index two. So this group is a Lie group. It has whatever components it has. And this group is, so to speak, twice as big. It has this as a subgroup and it has twice as many components. Okay. So there exists a coextension like that um, and a corresponding Um, co-extension of the affine group, including the, the translations. So I'll just write this. Um, such that the uh, G1 N minus one, let's say um, symmetry of the quantum field theory extends to a action of this bigger group um, or I should say symmetry such that the new elements act anti-linearly. So this original group, remember, is a um, subgroup of the, I mean, sorry, it maps by this row n to its action on vectors, which is uh, acting on the ones, that, the Lorentz transformations that preserve the time orientation. And that sits with index two inside all Lorentz transformations. And so, these new symmetries, of course, they have to be symmetries that also act on the points of space-time, of the Minkowski space-time. And the way they're acting on the points of Minkowski space-time, the new ones, the elements in this group minus the ones in this group, are the ones that reverse orientation. So the new symmetries reverse the time orientation. 
And remember that the image of this map is either the entire group or the subgroup of index two. And that's the same here. So depending on whether we have the, the reflection symmetry that will determine what the image of this map is. So that's the statement of the theorem that we get this bigger symmetry group where we can now have time reversal transformations act. They always act in whatever symmetry type you have. We have this bifurcation depending on the image and, um, but they act anti-linearly. And I'll explain again what precisely that means. Okay, any questions? All right, so why the beta? Okay. So that was really what Greaves and Thomas, I think, pointed out in their paper, that uh, there is another extension, a different extension, G alpha, uh, which does not act. Well, which let me say is used in the construction. So we're going to use this different, um, this different. All right. Um, okay. So let's look at what this looks like here. So these are the groups that we uh, just talked about before, the basic kind of symmetry types without having any uh, more exotic internal symmetries. And what does this group work out to be? Well, in the case of um, only bosons where we have this connected component of the Lorentz group, then we get two components of the Lorentz group. We get the ones that preserve the overall orientation. If we originally had two components, then we would get four of them like that. Now, if we start with the um, spin group, then uh, what we get is, well, we get that spin group is a double cover of the connected component of the Lorentz group, or probably what is called the Lorentz group. And so what we get is then a two component Lie group that double covers the, um, the subgroup of all Lorentz transformations, the ones that preserve the overall orientation. So not necessarily the time orientation, the off component here reverses time, but it also reverses the, the, the orientation of space. And so it preserves the overall orientation. And again, there are two double covers that we could have gotten, but the theorem tells us that we get one particular one. In fact, the alpha double cover is the other one. So there are two possible double covers that extend the spin group and we get a particular one. And the one we get is one that sits inside a Clifford algebra. Fact. And so the same here, that if we start with these pin groups, which again cover two out of four of the components of the Lorentz group, then we get a, a, a group that covers the entire Lorentz group. And what we get are what are called the standard pin groups. And again, these groups sit inside Clifford algebras. So let me emphasize that all of these groups sit inside Clifford algebras. So one consequence of this CPT theorem or this version with more general symmetry is that the, um, the symmetry groups that occur that double cover the orthogonal group, they all sit inside Clifford algebras. So it's been suggested in the past, you could have more exotic groups. You see just abstractly, if I look at this um, four component Lie group, there are lots of double covers whose identity uh, component is the spin group. There are a lot more than two of them, but um, it's only these two that can occur as symmetries of a quantum field theory. Excuse me, when you say sit inside here, do you just mean they're compatible with critical algebra, which means we don't need to modify no, 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 I, I mean, literally, by sitting side. literally they sit inside. So if I think of the orthogonal group of n by n matrices, that's of course a group of matrices, all n by n matrices, they form an associative algebra. 
right? We have a multiplication that's associative and it's unital, we have a unit. So th that group of orthogonal matrices sits inside that algebra. So that's very convenient. The group law is the matrix multiplication in the algebra. And it's very convenient to compute with that Lie group, ON, if it sits inside an algebra. So more generally, you say a Lie group is a matrix group if it comes embedded inside a matrix algebra, and that makes it easy to compute. The spin group is a group like that, or the pin groups, but the kind of matrix algebra they come in is a little more abstract. It's the associative unital algebra, which is the Clifford algebra. So it's again, a group sitting inside an algebra, but when you have that, it makes it easy to compute with the spin group because we compute inside the Clifford algebra using the algebra multiplication of the Clifford algebra. So it's not a compatibility, it's actually a sub a subset and then it's a group. Uh, it consists of invertible elements inside the algebra. That's okay. okay, good. Other questions, please feel free. All right, so I wanna say now uh, something about wick rotation. And so eventually we'll, I'll sketch a proof of that theorem. But before that, I wanna, uh, well, as, as a first step towards that is talk about wick rotation, talk about what happens to the symmetry type under wick rotation. And then we'll use that to give some structure theorems, which I won't prove, but which are in that paper, some structure theorems about uh, these symmetry types. Okay. So again, we have M, which is our Minkowski space time, and it's um, acted on by the translations, which is the group V of uh, translations. And so, um, Right, so I'm going to say- Excuse me, Dan, is it possible to interrupt with another question? Just yeah. make sure, because you introduced this, uh, uh, maybe the, I'll call the space-time symmetry group structure, and maybe also some internal symmetry earlier, the sum of the two. Uh, I was wondering, say, uh, at this moment, maybe you haven't uh, seriously introduced C, the, the charge conjugation C yet, correct? Well, no, but the complex conjugation will come out at the end of the day in the theorem. So that will come later. Yeah. It will come later. I, I just, I just want, want to probe whether this has something only to do when I introduce the internal symmetry group structure and then doing some automorphism on that group. Is that related right. to that? Uh, I said that uh, the, the no, 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 no. We're no. not going to see it as an outer. No, no, no. Not, not automorphism. No, no, no. Over the, you know, I see. So you don't. That, so then I think my, my question will be, do you need to introduce some internal symmetry group structure in order to see the C, the mean of C, the charge conjugation? No, so, no. so again, okay. no. so again, I stated the theorem in this general form for a general symmetry type, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, just as in geometry, you know, if I were doing Riemannian geometry or complex geometry or symplectic geometry, they all, and I think similarly, the quantum field theory with different symmetry types have a different flavor. So if you're studying a particular quantum field theory, you're working with a particular symmetry type. And for each such symmetry type, there is this theorem that tells you that the symmetry, which is really this affine version, including translations, that's the, the, the one that covers the Poincaré group, that's the one that acts on the Hilbert space and acts preserving the correlation functions and so on, that that extends to a, um, to a larger group, twice as large, so to speak, um, but that the new elements act anti-linearly. Okay, and I'll say what that means, at least in terms of the correlation functions, that they complex conjugate the correlation functions. So that's where the conjugation is, nothing else. So that's the theorem. Okay. Uh, in, maybe in which map or whatever can you say again, in which one? Pardon me? Uh, maybe, is it, is it a particular map or to define the charge conjugation? Or maybe map? I'm not, 
I, to I, define I, this group. I haven't defined it. I will define okay. it. Okay. No, I will define the group. But um, I better watch the time. Yeah. At least there's a one more hour, so don't worry. There is a definition of that group for sure. Yeah. So that that will come from the structure theory of these symmetry groups. So um, yeah. So maybe I'll say this in a kind of heuristic way, and then come back um, soon and and say it more precisely. But we're going to go from this Minkowski space time. We're going to go again very heuristically to a complex domain. So you should think that we start with several copies of this, which is the domain of an of a M point function, the correlation function. Those correlation functions will extend, so to speak, holomorphically to some complex domain. And in fact, the original values of that, uh, the correlation function, the real space time values will be boundary values. We'll see them as limits of this holomorphic function. That holomorphic domain includes a kind of wick rotated Euclidean space. And so we can go to the Euclidean. So that's a very cartoonish version. And I'll say more precisely what it means at least for two point functions. And, um, but at the moment, let's focus on the symmetry. And uh, here we go. So what does that mean for symmetry? Well, when we have the, the original symmetry in Minkowski space time, that's this column. So these are again, the vector groups. I'm not including the translations. And we have this group of symmetries, vector symmetries that map onto this uh, Lorentz group, not onto, at least onto the identity component. And the kernel, the ones that map to the identity that act trivially on the points of space time that's this internal group K, which I'm assuming is compact Lie group. Well, part of saying that the correlation functions extend to be these, our boundary values of these complex holomorphic uh, functions is saying that they're invariant under a complexification of this symmetry group. And so we get now complex Lie groups. This complex Lie group maps holomorphically to the orthog complex orthogonal group and this is what acts on the complexification of Minkowski space time. And this group is acting, or the um, affine version is acting, preserving the correlation functions here. And again, we have this internal symmetry group, now the complexification of this compact Lie group. Then when we restrict to Euclidean space, well, the orthogonal group, we get the, a different real form of the orthogonal group, which is the compact real form. So we get the usual uh, compact orthogonal group, whereas of course this group is non-compact, that's the Lorentz group. And we get then a group of symmetries that preserve the Euclidean or Schwinger correlation functions. And we get again, the internal symmetries. And one important point is that the internal symmetries under Wick rotation didn't change. There's no reason when you Wick rotate that you should think internal symmetries change. So one of the assumptions here is that this internal group is the same compact Lie group, okay? And um, yeah, so the fact that this Lie group here is compact and now the orthogonal group is of course compact implies that this group is compact. So once we go to Euclidean uh, signature after Wick rotating, we get a compact Lie group of symmetries without translations of vector symmetries. And it's that compactness that is used to prove the structure theorems I'm going to tell you because compact Lie groups are very rigid, they don't deform. So then you can use some Lie group theory that I won't go through, but which is in the paper to prove this uh, structure theory that I'll tell you. Okay. So maybe a quick remark is that, uh, so as I said, K, is undeformed, unchanged, under Wick rotation. That's one point. The image, uh, okay. 
Yes, and uh, so now we say definition, a um, wick rotated uh, symmetry type. Again, for quantum field theory is this pair GN, the compactly group with this homomorphism to ON and the image of this rho n is either S O N or the entire O N. So I've used this symbol rho n for all of these homomorphisms that take the full symmetry group or the vector symmetry group and tell us its action on vectors or on the points of space time. And the relativistic invariance is saying that um, we either hit the identity component or we hit the whole group. Okay. And so many times in quantum field theory, you start with the Wick rotated theory. And so you start with this symmetry type. So one remark is that this is, um, you know, from the point of view of Carton, which is the kind of general geometry, Klein and Carton and so on, these symmetry types um, are a lot easier because we're mapping to the orthogonal group. And when we go to curved manifolds, we have the levy chavita connection. We have this unique torsion-free connection. And so a lot of the complications from other types of geometry don't enter there. Um, okay. So just to be sure, let me say what, um, what this looks like for the here. Yeah, for the groups that we were talking about earlier, you can see very quickly what we get by quick rotating. It's no surprise that this rotates to SON, this rotates to ON, this rotates to the compact spin group. And then these two pin groups, they wick rotate to the two compact pin groups which are two component Lie groups that double cover the orthogonal group and the correspondence between the various possibilities and the plus and minus are what's in this table. Okay. By the way, if it's possible, also you can introduce new page, not in this. For me? I, I just mentioned that maybe there are some way you can introduce a new page without erasing. I didn't hear this. Oh, you didn't hear this? No. Okay. I no, see. They're, they're all here, <laughs> I promise you. Okay. But, but you should say you raised it somehow. I don't know. Ah, magic. Okay. It's a lot easier than quantum field theory, I assure you. All right. So, um, so now I want to tell you um, that when we have, as I said, not only this symmetry type, this compact Lie group, but we have the fact that it came from wick rotation. So we know when we go back, in particular, we get the same internal group. And those things are used to prove the following kinds of structure theory. So I'm going to state the structure theory. There may be a lot of statements, but hopefully it gives you a feeling for what it is. And the structure theory in short is, as I alluded to earlier, a version of the um, coleman mandula theorem, but starting with symmetry in this framework, which basically says the coleman mandula theorem, again, very roughly, would say that the symmetry is a product of the Poincaré group, the space-time symmetry, and the internal symmetry. So the main essence is that product structure. And so let's see what kind of product structure we get. So here's our compact. Now we're working, again, purely with this wick rotated compact group. So here's our compact symmetry type. And the orthogonal group, while it has an identity component, which is SON, and SON has a double cover, which is spin n. And so we're gonna pull this back um, to spin n in two steps. So we take a subgroup of GN, which is this group. It might be the same group if the original symmetry type only hit SON. And then we're going to take a double cover of that just by pulling back this double cover. So the principle is that when you pull back some kind of fibering, fiber bundle, or you pull back, in this case, a group extension, then twisting can only simplify. It can't get more twisted. 
And so by pulling back from the orthogonal group to the spin group, this group is going to be more untwisted in principle than this one. At least it can't be any more twisted. And that's what we'll find, that this pullback untwists this group. Uh, we'll see that shortly. And then there's one more pullback. Well, this is just seeing the identity component. And if we have elements here that map to the orientation reversing ones, those are theories that ultimately have time reversal symmetry, then we want to do this pullback. We're pulling back to one of the pin groups, and I chose pin plus. And so we define this group by that pullback. All right. So here are the theorems then, as I say, a la Coleman Mandula. And so the first one is that at the level of Lie algebras, we get a direct sum. So here we have this sequence of groups. We're not saying that this group here is a direct product of those, but at the level of Lie algebras, we are saying that the Lie algebra here is the direct sum of Lie algebras. And that is part of the coleman mandula theorem. But again, the coleman mandula theorem is working with a completely different starting point and so on. Second statement under that hypothesis is that the um, once I pull back to spin, this group does split as a, uh, as a direct product. So again, when we pull back GN all the way to spin, this group now is a product of the quotient and the sub of spin group and the internal symmetries. Okay. And once we know that, then we can recover the group that we get by um, taking the quotient. So we've pulled back by two steps. Now we know this one is the product. And so we can see how to get down to this one because we know how we got from the spin group to the group SON. And so what that tells us is that there must be a, a specific internal element, K naught, whose square is the identity. So K naught might be the identity or it might have order two. And that that's the element that gets identified with the central element in the spin group under the quotient that gives us our symmetry group. So again, these are the symmetries that cover SON, the preserve orientation in this wick rotated Euclidean space. Um, and, uh, and, and they're a quotient of this product. So this, this, this group might not be a product, but it's almost a product. It's double cover is a direct product. So again, this element plays an important role. That's the element that's going to, um, you know, play the role of what you would call minus one to the F when acting on the Hilbert space of a quantum field theory. Okay, finally, um, in the case that we have these uh, orientation reversing symmetries, then we wanna say, what is this group? This group, this double cover, so remember that's the one that was um, here, gotten from the pin double cover of the orthogonal group. And that double cover is not a product. It's not a product of pin and K, but it's twisting is measured by um, a simple extension of K or co-extension of the internal symmetries. So there's some co-extension here. Notice the N doesn't enter. There's some co-extension here whose pullback is telling us how twisted this is in terms of the pin group and the internal group. And then again, we can pass down to the actual group that's not double covering uh, the orthogonal group. Okay, so that's the structure theorem that tells us roughly we have the internal symmetries, spin and pin and the orthogonal group, SON, all those symmetries and sorry, the symmetries of space time in the internal group, it's not quite a product, but we have control over how it's twisted. That's what the structure theory tells us. And so anything we wanna do with the groups, if we know how to do it with the spin group, we know how to do it with the pin group, we know how to do it with the orthogonal group, then we know how to do it um, with the general symmetry group using the structure theory. So the first approximation, the internal symmetries carry along but we need the structure theory to see precisely how to carry them along. Okay, well, one corollary is now to get to the starting point of coleman mandula which is where the spin symmetry sits as a subgroup. And so here we see that the spin group does sit inside this vector symmetry group of our theory where the central element maps to this K naught. And now if we wick rotate back and we put in the translations, 
Then we see that the Poincaré group also maps into the whole symmetry group of the relativistic theory. Okay, well, here's a theorem that won't, um, we won't need today. This was part of an important part of the discussion with Mike. We needed to know that um, the symmetry type is what I would call stable, meaning if we have it in dimension n, then we have it in all dimensions. So there's a way to extend it. I mean, after all, it, yeah. So um, that was very important in this uh, work with the cobordism hypothesis because to define the right spectrum that classifies these theories, we needed a stable uh, homotopy type that gives a kind of tone spectrum. Whereas initially we had what's called a Madsen-Tillman spectrum that just uses this data. And it was unitarity that enabled us to do that. But that's a rather different story. All right, so any questions about that? So Duvin, I understand we go another half hour or so, is that correct? Yes, there, there's no strict funding, so feel free to go as long as you want. Okay. You can also take a break. Uh, no, that's okay, but maybe you need a break, I don't know. No, we're good? Oh, no, no. Okay. Um, okay, so let's use that, that um, structure theory to construct these groups, G, alpha, and beta. So again, remember that we start with this um, symmetry type this Lorentz kind of symmetry type, which is um, yeah, this homomorphism to here. And this sits with index two on the two, so to speak, from to, into the entire orthogonal group. And what we wanna construct then are these uh, co-extensions like this. Okay, so this is what we wanna construct. So we need to construct that. So we're going to do that using the structure theory. And um, yeah, so again, let me not go through in detail. I think it gets hard to follow. Um, so step one, maybe for G being the spin group, this alpha extension is going to be a subgroup of the complex spin group. So the complex spin group is a complex Lie group that has inside it the compact spin group, spin n. In fact, it, you know, as a space, it topologically a deformation retracts to the compact spin group that captures all of the topology. But also we have these other real forms, in particular in the rent signature, we have this two component group which is, um, well, there's a two component group whose identity component is this group spin one and minus one. And so this alpha extension in that case is this two component group that lives inside the spin group. The beta version, I said there were two, is what sits inside the Clifford algebra. So if we look at the even Clifford algebra, in either sign choice, the even parts are isomorphic and the spin group sits in there, the two component Lie group sits in there. And I think I was probably confused, I must say, that in probably conflating these two Lie groups and thinking that sitting inside the Clifford algebra and sitting inside the complex group were the same, but they're not. And when we Rick rotate, we will first of all find the, um, this one, because we have the complex Lie group as a symmetry when we extend to these holomorphic functions. But by the time we restrict back to the real points, there's a little sign change that comes, and this is the extension that ends up acting. Okay, so that's maybe what I wanted to say about the first step. Then we treat um, the pin analog, 
and I think I won't spell it out. And step three is to use the structure theory. In other words, once we know what happens for these basic cases, and we know that essentially the general group is a product, but we know the failure to be a product, then we can uh, use that to construct these general extensions that we need. So those are the constructions. And um, there's a theorem that tells us the basic properties of these proposition that tells us the properties of these uh, groups. So one is that the alpha extension in general, this is a subgroup, a real subgroup of the complex group. Really subgroup. Okay. And the second one is telling us something about the beta that supposing that we have a vector space, this R is a real vector space and it's Z2 graded. And this is a real uh, Z2 graded um, which you should think of as bosons fermions, a uh, representation of our initial vector symmetry group. And it satisfies that this particular element K naught, remember that's a special internal element which sits inside our symmetry group, acts as the grading. In other words, K naught is acts as the identity here and minus the identity here. And that's something which, um, you know, in our quantum field theory is going to follow from the spin statistics theorem. Okay. Then uh, the alpha extension, which is a subgroup by part one of the complex group, well, that acts on the complexification just because when you have a real representation, the complex, the complexification acts on the complexified vector space. Okay. And now if we have a group element in this alpha extension, that's not in the original group, then, So now inside this complex vector space, we have our original real vector space. And if we take the even part, that's preserved, but the odd part is not preserved and it maps to square root of minus one times the odd part. So this, ex this alpha extension does not act in a real way on this representation. It takes the odd elements and moves them. On the other hand, um, there exists a canonical action of the beta, which I haven't really told you how it's defined, but again, don't have time for all the details, uh, which is a real representation. So the construction of this alpha and beta extension allows us to take this element G in the alpha extension and find a corresponding element in the beta extension. And roughly speaking, that element is going to act by square root of minus one times the way that this element in the alpha extension acts. And that square root of minus one combines with this to tell us that we preserve R1. So the elements that weren't in our original group get that square root of minus one. All right. So that's the, um, that's the story there. So any questions? So now finally we can go to the setup of the CPT theorem of a quantum field theory, having done all this with the symmetry and we can sketch the proof of the CPT theorem. And um, I'm only going to do it, and that's all that's in the paper really for two point functions. Of course, to prove the theorem, you really have to consider general M point functions. So, um, but that would be a nice project, I think for somebody to do and uh, give a good exposition of this whole thing. But uh, so here we go. So I wanna talk about this uh, you know, sort of Whiteman quantum field theory 
and this wick rotation. Okay, so again, we have the Minkowski space time. That's the arena for this Whiteman theory. And we have the vector space of translations acting simply transitively. That's an affine geometry. And now we're going to give, um, well, a symmetry type, I should have said. So we have the symmetry type. And now we're going to give an action of this group on a vector space R. So this is a finite dimensional Z2 graded real. And this G acts by even transformations. It's an even uh, representation. So that means that each symmetry element in our, in our Lie group G acts preserving the grading. As I said, we could consider supersymmetries that might reverse it, but in this story, we're only considering the even one. Okay. Now a theorem jumping ahead without all the setup called spin statistics is going to say that K naught, this particular element, internal element, acts as the grading. Okay, so that comes later, of course, after we have the fields and so on and the correlation functions, but the bottom line is we should know now that uh, we know the grading operator there. Okay, so what are classical fields? Well, classical fields are functions from M into um, this vector space R. <clears throat> so, a classical scalar field, if that's all we had, we would have this is the <clears throat> one dimensional trivial representation of the group. <clears throat> and this vector space is the zero vector space. <clears throat> but if we have more complicated bosonic and fermionic fields, then they're encoded by that representation. So what's a quantum field? Uh, so these are R valued distributions. Um, phi, which again has an even part and an odd part or bosonic and fermionic part on this M, on Minkowski space time. And we also have a Hilbert space, which is um, again, Z2 graded. The state space of the theory and inside the even part, we have a vacuum. Right. So the two point function, well, that's a function that's a distribution, so it takes in two functions. And these functions are functions from M into the dual space of R. And um, we can write it in terms of an integral kernel. We integrate over the Cartesian square. These functions against, well, what we would write as the Schwartz kernel, which would be written this way. And in terms of the Hilbert space, this is the vacuum expectation value of the product phi of F1, that operator phi of F2. So that's the two point function. And now we use the translation invariance to define a function that just depends on the difference between the two points. So the vector xi is now in the vector space V. 
it's the displacement vector between the two points. And this is equal to um, phi of p, phi of p plus six i. And the translation invariance tells us that's independent of the choice of p, of course. Okay. So this w is then a distribution on v. And I'll write a distribution using this notation. I don't know that people do that, but in algebraic geometry, for example, a rational function that's not defined everywhere would be written like that. So it seems reasonable to write a distribution that way. And it takes values actually in the com complex uh, complexification of R. And it still has two kinds of values because of the two fields here. So it's a distribution like that. All right. Um, actually, actually, may I ask something? Okay. Yep. So maybe I miss when you earlier in the this left left hand side. Uh, you show this. Uh, you say quantum field a real value distribution was phi zero and phi one. Uh, I think oh, it I, takes values in this vector space. Yeah. But but let me just make sure. Uh, there are two things. One is why not the field take maybe more general value. You can consider complex or even. Maybe, maybe some representation of some symmetry group. Well, symmetry group. yes. If if you have a complex representation, this is the underlying real representation. Okay, but 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 then but you also say that phi zero and phi one are actually related to the z two graded. Yes. So the fermion. Yeah, the distribution theory. takes values in the z two graded vector space. So I just write it. Okay. Okay. So you, so you break. And, okay. Fermionic components, that's all. All right. Okay. Okay. But, so but, now but, we want to. But, but, so just make sure, but, but why not work on maybe complex value or other value? Why, why, why choose real value here? It's, it's again, most general. Again, if, if, if it's complex valued, I, I just want you to, to, to say this is the underlying real vector space. So you might have extra symmetries, like the fact that it's complex valued that you can use, but I'm giving the general story. So in okay. the general story, that complex structure is not playing a role. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So now let's uh, get to the Wick rotation. So I'll call, sorry for all the notation, but I don't know how to avoid it. But um, so V plus is going to be a component of time-like vectors. So those are the vectors, the displacements, which have positive norm square. And these are the ones where the, the say, the, the time component is positive. So these are the positive time-like vectors. And now we'll define what's called the, um, so these are the positive time-like. And now we'll define what's called the backward tube. So this is going to be um, the real vectors minus uh, the imaginary ones, which are uh, positive time-like. So if you like the negative time-like vectors, and that sits inside the complexification of the displacements. And finally, I'm going to define this domain D. And this is again, the domain for two-point functions. For more general functions, we have um, more to do. But I'm going to apply all um, orthogonal, special orthogonal transformations to this backward tube, and then take the union of that with the negative, all the negative vectors gotten that way. So this is again a subset, now an open subset of VC. So let me give you a picture, which I can't draw, of course, in arbitrary dimensions. And the picture is um, for n equals one, but unfortunately the theorems and the geometry that we need is only valid when n is at least two or three, but nonetheless, the picture I think helps. So there's the picture. And um, so here we have the real uh, one dimensional space. So in n equals one, we just have time. And so this is time, there's no space-like vectors. And um, 
the backwards tube, well, okay, so the forward time-like vectors, everything is time-like, the forward time-like vectors are here, that's the V plus. And so if I take and multiply that by I inside the complexification, that would be here. And so this part here is what T is, this backward tube. The orthogonal group for N equals one, the special orthogonal group is just the trivial group. And so all I do is union with the minus, and so I get this region. So the complexification of V is here rendered as this one-dimensional complex line or two-dimensional complex uh, real plane. And this region D is the complement of this one line, this one vector subspace. And so you see that the original vectors don't sit in the domain D, but they sit on the boundary. And now the statement, um, the theorem about Wick rotation is the theorem that really comes from positivity of energy. So positive energy is what's implying this theorem. And this theorem is, um, says that there exists a holomorphic distribution WC. So this is on D, it's a distribution, maps to WC, uh, oops, R complexified squared, I guess, um, such that if I wanna compute the original distribution, on Xi, the original correlation functions, so again, I should smear them out to make sense of this, but I wanna compute them on a real vector. It needn't be forward time-like or anything like that, an arbitrary vector, that this is the limit as I approach um, this vector from, be from below, from, from this tube here, in this case. So this is the limit of this, complexified holomorphic correlation function coming from below. So here Xi is an arbitrary real vector and eta is a forward time-like vector. Okay. And so that's the, um, the extension. That was the first step when I gave you the cartoon of um, Wick rotation earlier somewhere. Here, I think I gave you this cartoon where we start in Minkowski, we go to the complex domain. That's what we've just done. And now we wanna to restrict to the Euclidean domain. And how do we restrict to the Euclidean domain? Well, I didn't write all the necessary things over here. So if we wanna to restrict to the Euclidean domain, we have to write V as sort of U uh, direct sum its orthogonal complement, uh, where U is time-like. And then we take the um, Euclidean, uh, rotate, the Wick rotation to be the square root of minus one times those time-like things plus the same perpendicular. So this is inside the complexification. And so that's what you see in this picture. This blue line is the Euclidean one, but we're missing the origin. Okay, but that's the domain of the Schwinger function. And then the Euclidean or Schwinger function is WE, uh, which is the distribution we get by restricting this holomorphic one to um, these real points, these Wick rotated points. All right, so that's the standard kind of Whiteman picture. Any questions about that? So the geometric lemma that we need, and again, this is Yost, is that, um, again, assuming N is at least three, space-time dimension, that uh, any, and this is, again, has a generalization for the endpoint functions, but we're doing the two-point function geometry, any real uh, space like Xi 
which is in the real vector space and therefore in the complexified vector space actually lies in this domain D. So that's something we can't see in this picture for n equals one. This is the picture n equals one. We can't see it, well, because there are no space-like vectors in n equals one. We just have time, we don't have space. So every vector is time-like. So that we can't see. And indeed in this picture, the domain D doesn't contain any real points at all. No points of our original Minkowski translations. Reuven, are you asking a question? I guess, maybe naive. Uh, it seems like a, there's a point origin or the, the zero points for spatial. Uh, can you say something about it? Well, I think earlier, not, not just because you are doing, for example, reflection or uh, inversion, but also that when you try to write correlation function, it seems like there's the, the origin. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, okay. yeah so, so from the beginning, right, I distinguished between um, between the Minkowski space-time, which are the points, that's where the correlation functions are defined. That's where geometry is on an affine space. That's the arena of flat geometry. And then we have a symmetry group, which is the vector space under vector addition. That's acting as symmetries, displacements between the points. So I'm distinguishing those. And you're absolutely right that in the affine space, we don't have a base point. But in the vector space, we do. We have the zero displacement, the zero identity element of the group. And that's what the zero is here. So this is all taking place in the group. And the way it's taking place in the group is we use the translation invariance, wherever that is, here. We use it to rewrite the two-point function in terms of a single vector, the vector that displaces between the two points. So that's why we have a zero displacement. Okay. Does that answer your question? No problem. And let me make sure, no notation. Just make sure uh, earlier, maybe one slide earlier, when you have this map F, map from, uh, I suppose the manifold M to R star. What's that star? Just make sure I understand the meaning. Uh, that star is the dual, dual vector space. So this is a smooth function. This is a C infinity function. So a distribution is something dual to smooth functions, these distributions. And so we're going to evaluate on these smooth functions, usually called test functions. So these are smooth test functions. But um, yeah, they're going to be, I mean, when I smear this out, just because I had vector values, the, the test functions take values in the dual space. The distribution takes values in R. And so the pairing gives me a real number. This after all is a, or a complex number. This after all is a, is a number. It's not in some abstract vector space. So that's why. So this is the vector space dual. Okay. So part one of the lemma tells us that we have these real points inside um, this complex domain. And part two says that this complex domain is connected. And so again, you see that for n equals one on the left, it's clearly not connected. So that's false. All right. So if you still have energy and patience, then I can sketch very um, a little bit how you prove this, uh, this theorem, this CPT theorem. So let me say what some properties of this um, complexified, this holomorphic uh, kind of two-point functions are. So again, this is in terms of the displaced vector. So, um, well, one thing is that we can write it as a sum of a sort of even part and an odd part, meaning when we put in the test functions, well, what you should think is we're taking here correlation functions of two bosonic fields. Here we're taking correlation functions of two odd or fermionic fields. So each of these Ws is a distribution on this complex domain with values in the complexified vector space, but either the zero or the one part. But these are even, a correlation function between a single bosonic field and a single fermionic field is zero. So we don't have any kind of mixing like that. Okay, 
Now the symmetry is telling us that if I evaluate this at zeta, so here zeta is in the domain. And now if I take a group element, I'll write G alpha, which is in this symmetry group, um, well, in the complexified symmetry group. So let me write it first, that this is, um, yeah, I didn't give a name, so okay. Sigma of G alpha squared times the thing on the uh, transform point, transform vector, not point. Okay, so I said part of the data is this action I'm calling sigma. That's just the action of the symmetry on the values of the field. If we have a vector field that acts by the vector representation and so on. And um, so this is saying that this holomorphic correlation function is invariant under the complexified group. And now one of these group extensions is the one that sits inside the complexified group. And so we get this symmetry of this group extension like that. Okay, so right away we get this extension, but this alpha extension, which acts. All right. The next thing is that if xi is real, so it lies in the vector space V, not its complexification, is real and space-like, um, and let's say xi is also therefore in D, that's part one of the lemma. The lemma says up here that any real space-like vector lies in D. So this lies in D. Then, um, then I claim that W naught, I'll write two equations, that if I change the sign of the displacement, then the correlation function doesn't change if it's bosonic, but if it's fermionic, it changes sign. So this is the statement that when we have space-like separated points, that is to say the displacement between them is um, space-like, then the operators commute, the correlation functions have the symmetry. But if we commute two fermionic ones, we pick up a sign. And so this is that space-like separated commutation, that kind of locality that's written there. All right. Now here comes something a little bit tricky. So if I take a point P in Minkowski space-time, just to be able to evaluate, and then I take Xi in a real vector, any real vector, and here finally is where complex conjugation comes in. So I wanna say, what is the complex conjugated um, correlation function, two-point function? Well, if you look at the definition of the two-point function, you'll see that these um, quantum fields appeared on the right after the comma. And so by switching the order of the arguments, of course, we complex conjugate by the conjugate linearity of the inner product. And now we can bring these back to the other side because for real vectors, these operators are self-adjoint. But since we're also considering fermionic operators, we have to worry about what that self-adjointness exactly means when we have odd operators. And here the standard convention in physics is, um, I would dare say wrong, meaning that in Z2 graded in mathematics, when we have the Z2 grading, we follow very strictly what's called the Cojule sign rule, which gives us a minus sign when we commute two odd variables. And that rule is kind of violated in a few different canceling places in physics and, um, that sign, you use the physics conventions or the, the, the ones that obey the causal sign rule, which I think are the safer ones because it's consistent, we know. Uh, in either case, you get a plus sign there. So I'll let you look in the paper for the more detailed discussion. But then you're taking the correlation function here in the opposite order of where the two point function is defined, wherever that is, here. So the correlation function here is defined in that order. And here we get it in the opposite order. So that's the correlation function for minus xi. Okay.
And so that's the um, sign we get. And now if you put together the last few things, what you find is that W naught for the bosonic one, the complex conjugate is equal to itself. So it's real. And for the fermionic one, the complex conjugate changes sign. All right, so I think I just need about seven more minutes. And um, yeah, so that's pure, purely imaginary. And again, this is for xi real space like. So maybe I should have used a different letter, but xi real space like is what's being used here. And we're combining that equation with this equation. And if we combine these two sets of equations, we get these. Okay. And now that implies that um, in this by analyticity, plus the fact that this domain D is connected, then we deduce that, um, well, let me just write it in one shot. WQ of zeta is minus one to the Q times WQ. Uh, whoops, sorry. If I complex conjugate, I get the complex conjugate point. But for the fermionic one, I get a sign. And so there we have that, um, that equation. So this is, you see, like a Schwartz reflection. I don't know if there's a T in that. Name. This is like a Schwartz reflection kind of um, formula in complex variables, but in this uh, context. So again, th this is for the real points, but not all real points, just the space-like ones. But the fact that our domain, at least when n is at least three, has these uh, space-like points allows us to conclude something on the open set, on an open set of these space-like points and then by analyticity, analytic continuation, we have that this has to hold everywhere once we write it in holomorphic terms. And so that's the term. When I reflect, meaning take complex conjugate of the variable, then I conjugate the quantity, except that I pick up a sign. All right, so those are the basic ingredients. And now we can say what the kind of proof of this CRT theorem is. Um, and so for that, we'll start with this picture here, where, um, here, here it is, where we've written the correlation function for a um, real vector as a limit of these holomorphic correlation functions. And now we have all of these facts about our um, holomorphic correlation function that we can use. And so we just apply them. So that's the idea. So um, let's take uh, G alpha again in this alpha extension, because that's where we know the symmetry. That was this statement here, that we have this symmetry for the complex group and therefore this alpha extension. And so, um, yeah, we'll take that and we'll take it to be time reversing. So that means that it lies in these new elements. So that means the G alpha of the positive time-like vectors gives us the negative time-like vectors. And then we take xi real as before and eta to be real positive time-like. And now if we look at the complex conjugate of xi of the correlation function there, well, this is the limit from the, the below, this tube in this case, uh, WQ C of xi minus epsilon i eta, and we take the complex conjugate. Now we apply the symmetry. The symmetry tells us that we get the action of alpha squared WQ of, well, rho n, the action of this group element on xi minus epsilon i, the action of this group element 
on eta. And the whole thing is complex conjugated. And now there's one point that we have to be careful of, which is I've complex conjugated this action and said I get you know, that this equation holds, which means that this has to be acting in a real way. And well, the lemma here somewhere is that this alpha action only acts in a real way on the even vectors. But these even vectors, since I'm squaring, again, these correlation functions, they are even. I either have two bosonic or two fermionic fields. So that manipulation is valid. Then we get the limit. Now we use the, well, the, this, uh, That's real, as I said, and now we use the statement that's in the box on the left. And so we pick up a sign minus one to the Q and we get the correlation function on the complex conjugated point. So the complex conjugated point is rho mg alpha psi plus epsilon i rho mg alpha of eta. But you see this eta is positive time-like but rho n of it, this is negative time-like, but we have the wrong sign here. And so it's minus a positive time-like thing again. And that limit is exactly the one that we were taking to get the real correlation function on real vectors. In other words, Minkowski space-time. And so we get this thing, WQ of rho n g alpha on xi. So what it says is that our real correlation function, the ones we start out with, the Whiteman function, this two-point function, it's not quite invariant under these new transformations in the alpha group. It would be conjugate invariant except for this sign. So it's not quite invariant because of that sign. But that's where we switch to the beta. So if G beta is the corresponding element of this beta extension, this off component, then um, it acts, as I said, by I times the action of the alpha guy. And since we're acting twice, because of this correlation function, we have these two fields, that gives a minus sign, and that's only on the fermionic part that it acts with that extra sign, and so that cancels. And so this is actually equal to sigma of this G beta squared W rho n of this G beta xi. And that's the end of the proof. That's the invariance of the Whiteman function, the two-point function up to the complex conjugation. So I think I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, Professor Gentry, for the nice, wonderful lecture. Questions on the audience, please. Please feel free to ask. Well, that's fine. <laughs> I have a nice question. So yep. you consider point function, which is a two-point function, and you also comment about n-point function hasn't been uh, shown. That's one thing to say, uh, maybe it's really naive. Oh, wait, 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 let's stop there. Okay. The n-point function hasn't been shown. No, I mean, of course, Yost's proof of the CPT theorem did the n-point function. And if you look in Streeter and Whiteman, or you look at Kajdan's lectures, for example, in the IAS quantum field theory books that cover this ground, okay. of course, they do the general function. Right, but, um, but you say it, not, not, not based on your paper, uh, not based on your method. Or, well, our method, no, uh, let's be careful. So the method in this proof is exactly Yost's. I'm not saying the method is any different. And just that the symmetry, usually it's done without this general symmetry type. So the only innovation is to put in a general symmetry type. As I said, this paper of Greaves and Thomas, I think put their finger on a key point, which is this last point with this sign and between the alpha and beta extension. So you have to be very careful about the signs. But other than that, then yes, you have to put in these general symmetry groups, but that's where this theory that we developed of these general symmetry groups 
comes in. But when you get to the CPT theorem, there's nothing new. I mean, that's already been done in the structure theory. So I don't want to say there are any new ideas going into this proof because I, I really don't think there are, but there's a opening for exposition, if you like, to, to really give a, a good account and, um, and do it with the endpoint functions and some more details and so on. But yes, that's, I, I think all the main ideas are, are here. Okay. The geometry with the endpoint functions is a little different, but those lemmas that I gave about the geometry, they're replaced by, so instead of the real space-like vectors, you have what are called Yost points, which a collection that satisfies a certain, anyway, those are used to get this kind of Schwartz reflection property, which is the, the key point to be able to make the maneuvers on the right-hand side. Yeah, so, sorry. So, okay, no problem. so the first, first maybe question is that is this proof to present here a small hexametric type of a proof uh, in contrast with the reference you mentioned with uh, Friedrich and uh, Thomas. That, uh, Which that, one? Friedrich uh, and White? No, no that, that was no axiomatic. And there's also the oh, oh, reference oh, oh, oh. of ex Griffiths and Thomas, I think. Oh, Greaves and Griffiths Thomas. And, yeah, no, they, they, Thomas. they're working in some framework that I don't know. They, they called formal field theory or Lagrange. I, right, I'm, not, formal Lagrange. So I, I'm just unfamiliar with it, but I, I'm not saying that. Yeah, I mean, whatever they did there, I, I think translates here. I, I don't think it's essentially different. So, um, okay. Yeah, uh, that, I don't that, think it's essentially different. So. Yeah, my second question actually is the, yeah, is the main question. So, I wonder why consider just endpoint functions, the local operator instead of some maybe generally quantum field theory might have extended operators. So oh, that's, I see. That's, that's the thing also should be considered. I'm not sure. Basically, just wondering so why not consider the correlation function for Well, okay. Minus. I mean, I mean, we did this, as I said, in the framework of Whiteman field theory, just because we have the foundation of all the work that was done, um, you know, spin statistics and all that. And again, you know, this is the, the proof that Yost, I mean, it is that theorem. It's not anything new except for putting in uh, the general symmetry types into the discussion. So um, if you want to, put the line operator, surface oper other operators into the Whiteman framework, then, you know, I, I don't, well, I didn't think, think through that. It's a good question. And I think that's a more general question than just this CPT theorem, I suppose. Um, you know, you, I mean, these Whiteman your, uh, functions are using certain properties of distributions and so on to make the arguments. So if you really want to um, kind of axiomatize what these line operators are, you'd have to you know, be careful about those analytic points, I would say. But uh, I don't think geometrically there would be any new ideas or with the symmetry. Um, yeah, I don't think there would be any new ideas. And formally, of course, I could write the same expressions. Instead of writing phi of p, I would write phi of some submanifold where this extended operator lives. And I think you'd make you know, the same manipulations, but not having done them, I don't want to guarantee that. So at least formally, you would make the same manipulations. But if you want to think about what it means to give it the name theorem, then I think you have to develop the framework enough to, to have those operators there acting, say, on the Hilbert space or acting in some way. So again, they're distributions that, you know, instead of being supported at a point, so to speak, are supported a line. So you're smearing along, you know, some function that you might think of as supported in a tubular neighborhood of the support of your operator and et cetera, et cetera. So you may have to develop a little bit, a kind of distributional theory that's supported on submanifolds. And I, I don't know. I mean, you'll have to say a little bit carefully in this framework what these extended operators are. But I think once you do that, the arguments should go through uh, the same way. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, questions for all of this? All right. Well, I hope, Juven, that yeah. I okay. satisfied the request you made to, 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 to you give you this I'm, I'm sure many people, pedagogical lecture. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure many people benefit from it. And it's all on YouTube, so people will certainly pay attention, understand it more. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dan. Take care. Yeah. Okay.